Budget 2023 clearly checked in all the important boxes when it came to capex growth led focus and also focus coming in on the fiscal prudence. That was a splendid job that the budget, but how does it stack up overall for the steel sector? Let's actually find that out from the company's managing director, Mr. Vrindendra Jha. Thank you so much for taking out the time and speaking to Money Control. I'm going to start off by asking you about your assessment overall on this budget the key areas that you think were a positive coming in for the sector and your assessment on the hike that is coming through the infra on the infra development allocation of around 10 lakh crore your word on that uh, thank you very much i think uh, it has been absolutely a dream budget for um, uh, the steel and cement sector in particular because of what you said just now that 10 lakh crores has been allocated uh, for infrastructure and construction and JSP in particular is completely focused on infrastructure and construction in its product portfolio. Additionally, there is also focus on railways. And of course, we are apart from Steel Authority, the only other company in the, steel, in, in the country that manufactures rails. Uh, there is also a push on urbanization for uh, B and C class townships and which also consumes a lot of steel and cement. So a lot of positivity is over there. But in addition to all this, there is also a focus on green energy. And uh, as the steel industry looks forward to decarbonization and its own role in that one, and JSP in particular, which has got CGP-based DRI, where there is some experience with hydrogen-based reduction, uh, as the green energy and green hydrogen starts becoming available, uh, we will be very happy to lap it up and uh, use it in our processes. So it is not just the short term, but we are also seeing that for the long term, there are many, many positives in this budget. Kudos to the uh, finance minister for that. Okay, so let's let's get into the specific parts of it, right? Let's talk about the railways part of it first, where, you know, on the fine front, we've seen the highest capital allocation coming into railways to an extent of um, you know almost nine times that we've seen in 13 14. i would want to understand with this how does the on-ground situation change for you are you looking at a different product mix now with this budget or everything remains the same see this budget i think uh, sets the tone for the growth of rail network in india and improvement sure. in rolling stock uh, rail network is absolutely essential and uh, if country has to grow and if it has the ultimate ambition of being able to produce 300 million tons of steel, then uh, there is three times that cargo that has to move uh, on the wheels for raw materials and then the finished goods have to move. So unless the rail infrastructure is strengthened, uh, lines are doubled, rolling stock is available, this dream is going to remain only in the pipeline. And therefore, I think that uh, not just uh, the gain that we get as GSP from production of rails as this uh, expansion takes place, or as our future expansion is coming up in uh, hot rolled coils where we can produce the right grades of steel for uh, making the uh, railway wagons, uh, it is also from the point of view of the future of the industry, uh, particularly industries that are dependent on mining, that are dependent on movement of bulk materials. This is a big push in that direction. And also, as I said, that anybody who is dependent on energy uh, and steel industry, cement industry, all these industries are dependent a lot on energy. The push on the green side is again going to help decarbonization. Sure, decarbonization is a topic which I'm sure is, uh, you know, caught up a lot of traction in the recent past and rightfully so on account of the measures that need to be taken. Um, but with that in perspective, again, going back to the same question that I wanted to understand is, you think this higher allocation towards railway will lead to any change in the product mix for players like you and sale because you are predominantly, I mean, the only two steel makers which supply into the rail. How does that, you know, how does that stack up for you in terms of the financials, in terms of the product sales? See, rail is the single largest value creator per ton of steel. Uh, if you look at the entire portfolio 
of products and uh, it is also a difficult product to produce having that experience we look forward to further investments uh, in this particular area we are also putting up a rail force plant uh, and uh, we are happy to expand our capacity in heat treated rails which is going to be one of the thrust areas in this kind of an expansion where railways would want to increase the speed of the trains and for that they would need head hardened rails and we are in a position to give these head hardened rails and we have we are already approved for it so these are some of the reasons why we are bullish about it but that is only from the product portfolio perspective what i said was that rail infrastructure is critical to the growth of any industry which moves material in bulk and that is where i'm saying that it is good news for everybody in steel sector aluminum sector power sector sure. as well as uh, cement sure sure i i take that point completely on board uh, mr shah but i was just wanting to see if you know if we are looking in the near term any kind of product mix that we're looking at after the higher allocation that has come in but i'll move on to the affordable housing segment now because nomura in its report had suggested that you know the spends coming in on that segment is almost a budgeted flatish at 0.91 billion so do you think there is a continuing declining trend since fy22 with that segment and how does that augur in terms of the demand for the sector so when we talk about low cost housing that doesn't by itself augur very well for the steel industry actually it is urbanization which augurs well for the steel industry so if we look at the thrust in this budget it is more on urbanization of b and c class uh, uh, townships and cities where the natural choice of material is steel and cement now this is where all the development that is taking place in the product mix also replaces some amount of cement which makes it possible for pe people to construct buildings using more and more steel so steel intensity of demand can potentially increase as a result of this push for urbanization which is a counter uh, and more than counters any flattish curve on affordable housing sure okay let's also talk about the decarbonization initiative that you know uh, the company has been uh, undertaking for the last couple of years let's also talk about the green energy initiative that has been taken under the budget could you just take us through that so in the green energy uh, space there is a critical success factor uh, for any energy intensive industry is round the clock availability of power and round the clock uh, availability of power comes from a combination of uh, various modes of energy generation so for example solar energy is only uh, available during 12 hours of the day but energy consumption in our kind of industries is 24 hours a day so round the clock energy requires uh, hydro power or pump storage or many other options that people uh, wind for example uh, all these options have to be combined now when the government starts making a push for green energy it is not just a push for a particular form of generating green energy but it is about making this energy available round the clock and therefore any investment in this area it starts with energy generation but it also goes to the areas such as generation of green hydrogen and other sources of energy that can be stored when there is excess energy and can be used as a fuel when there is uh, no uh, that source disappears for example during the night so uh, for steel industry there is an additional advantage that comes out of all this the additional advantage is that uh, with the thrust on green energy it becomes possible to get green hydrogen and then green hydrogen becomes a source of reductant in place of carbon and that's where the decarbonization takes place because 2 to 2 and 1/2 tons per ton of uh, steel is what is the kind of uh, energy that is uh, uh, carbon emission that is done by the steel industry 
and that happens primarily because of iron being iron oxide being reduced using carbon so when this change takes place we see not in the immediate future but we see the step in the right direction for production of green hydrogen so sure, let's shift back the focus now to earnings because we've seen some amount of uh, you know contraction coming in in terms of the standalone ebitda both on sequential as well as year on basis more than 20% kind of decline that we're seeing in that number but i would like to understand from you if there are any cost saving measures at play which is going to be playing out in the next quarter and what kind of numbers on the operational front can be expected in the next year so first of all all comparisons with last year i would say that uh, it is once in a lifetime sure. that the steel industry uh, <laughs> saw those kind of prices uh, and anything will uh, in comparison look very pale and therefore it is not the right comparison particularly last year versus this year uh, what should be actually looked at is that what happened during the current financial year and uh, you could see that there was a huge price decline bottoming out somewhere in november when we saw that uh, the chinese uh, hot roll coil, coil price index it went down to 520 dollars since then by end of december it uh, it started improving and went to 620 dollars but that is the time when coking coal prices also started going up as far as gsp is concerned up to quarter 3 what happened was that we had flattish uh, net sales realization about 1% down only despite all this decline in prices because of product mix changes etc but we had 9% decline quarter on quarter in our costs as a result our standalone ebitda went up by 52% and even on a at a gross basis it was 51% increase in ebitda margins uh, ebitda uh, so all that what we saw was a growth story that came more from cost reduction now going forward what is happening is that coking coal prices have gone up and iron ore prices have gone up uh, both omc and nndc have increased prices now as a result there would have been a concern for steel industry if there was any demand slackness what we see is that this quarter and even the coming quarter looks to be very strong on demand side therefore uh, the steel producers are able to pass on these cost increases there would have been concern if this cost increase could not be passed on so cost increases are being able to pass on and there is robust demand which means that the margins are going to be protected if not firmed up for the current quarter so this is what is our assessment of the situation of course there is always a factor of china uh fortunately it worked well over last uh, month or so where after the covid restrictions were lifted china had uh, shown the positivity in demand and as a result the prices started moving up uh then they went into this chinese new year holiday and as they come back that is the situation that is going to open up for the world whether there will there is going to be further up thrust in demand as well as supply Sure, Mr. Shah. The last question that I'd like to squeeze in is in terms of the volume picture, right? Because export duties have been taken off. So my limited understanding is now that China has opened up. Do you think, in that perspective, even if the uh, export duties have been rolled back, will not be as much of beneficial coming in for the industry because there will be an increased amount of competition that we'd be still looking at with the China reopening? Or your assessment on that? And also, if you could help us with the growth figure that you're looking at uh, with the volume number. so uh, as you have seen that first 9 months of the year domestic demand went up by 12% whereas production went up by only 6% so that means there was that much of extra capacity in india to consume this uh, steel that was coming up and in fact uh, india was not affected negatively in a big way uh, although the prices kept on declining now what happens with uh, export duty removal is that this provides a pressure release valve just in case a particular product category for example uh, does not have enough local demand then export duty creates a uh, non level playing field 
because imports can keep happening and exports there is no possibility then there is a problem now that that problem is out of the way the pressure release valve can work but why would anybody anybody want to export when there are domestic customers uh, vying for your products so uh, exports is not a big factor per se unless there is a pressure on a particular segment now coming to the chinese market opening up and therefore those opportunities going away of course we would not like our existing relationships which got disrupted as a result of uh, all this uh, export duty which we are restoring now we don't want those relationships to be uh, disrupted and we would like to continue with those relationships these relationships are stronger with the kind of quality and delivery that we make and with the china plus strategy particularly being looked at in the west therefore we do not see much of a much of an issue if we want to export but on the other hand we do not see the necessity of export as much because of the good domestic demand fair enough point well taken on board thank you so much for taking out the time and speaking to money control we are running out of time so apologies for that but then it was indeed a pleasure talking to you as always thank you very much always a pleasure talking to you